this is the first talk about the median nerve. It is intended for the Neurophysiology Fellows at Niklaus Children's Hospital. It will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question is, the median nerve arises from the medial and lateral cords, A true, B false. The brachial plexus can be divided in three regions. The cords are taken as the boundary for these regions. Above the cord is the proximal region, below the cord is the distal region, the cords themselves are the middle region. Six nerves arise from the proximal region. Seven arise from the middle region. And five nerves from the distal region. Of these five nerves, two are posterior, the axillary nerve, and the radial nerve, and three are anterior. The origin of these three anterior nerves arising from the brachial plexus resemble an M. The median leg of the M is the median nerve. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The sensory innervation of the lateral half of the ring finger courses through the dash of the brachial plexus. A. Lateral branch of the lateral cord. Lateral branch of the medial cord. C. Posterior cord. D. Medial branch of the medial cord. In this graph, I have illustrated the spinal cord and the oval elements are the dorsal root ganglia. The median nerve is a mixed nerve, thus it has a sensory component that innervates the palm of the hand, the palmar and distal most aspect of the index and middle fingers, as well as the lateral half of the ring finger and their dorsal tip. That is according to Levine and Luther's book. In this book, they describe that all the sensory fibers going to the hand arises from the dorsal root ganglia of C6 and C7. Thus, they have a trajectory that involves the medial branch of the lateral cord, the lateral cord, the anterior division of the superior and middle trunks these trunks and the ventral rami of C6 and C7. In addition, all the proximal elements involved in the formation of the C6 and C7 ventral ramus are involved which include the spinal nerves, roots, and rootlets. These later structures are not shown in this picture. Now, let's go back to the initial figure, but this time, instead of relying on the explanation given by Levins and Luders, as far as the sensory component of the median nerve is concerned, I would put forward 
the description found in Preston and Shapiro's book. In this book, the cutaneous innervation of the hand is divided in two regions. One region is the palm, index, and middle finger, including their distal dorsal aspects, which is supplied by fibers from C6 and C7 dorsal root ganglia. And the second region is the lateral side of the ring finger. This region is innervated from the C8 dorsal root ganglia. Thus, in addition to the previously mentioned trajectory of the fibers that we described when we were talking about Luther's and Levine explanation of the trajectory of the sensory fibers in the brachial plexus, now we have to include those that innervate the bulk of the hand as the one that we describe in Levin's and Luther, but in addition, we have to include the fibers for the lateral half of the ring finger, which travel through the lateral branch of the media cord, the media cord, the anterior division of the lower trunk, the lower trunk, and the ventral ramus of C8, as well as the proximal structure that we previously mentioned, which include the spinal nerve, the dorsal roots and rootlets. Thus, the innervation of the whole median territory of the hand, according to Preston and Shapiro, involve more brachial plexus structures than according Levine and Luthers. So why this discrepancy? Well, if you look at this dermatome map in this frame, you see that the sensory innervation of the ring finger is shared between C7 and C8. If you look at this other dermatomal map, the ring finger is innervated only by C8 fibers. Whereas if you look at this third one, the ring finger is innervated by C7. But regardless which way you slice it, sensory fibers of the median nerve do not go through the posterior cord, the lateral branch of the lateral cord, nor do they go through the medial branch of the medial cord. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. C5 ventral ramus do not contribute to the formation of the median nerve. A true, B false. Now, we're going back to the original figure showing the Preston Shapiro description of sensory innervation of the hand. I will now add the median nerve motor innervation. Motor innervation can be divided in two regional system. The proximal regional system for the forearm. The forearm is innervated by C6 to T1 motor fibers arising from the anterior horns of C6 
through T1 spinal segments. These fibers involve a wide region of the brachial plexus. The region they involve is similar to the one described by Preston and Shapiro for the innervation of the sensory cutaneous of the hand. The only exception is the incorporation of fibers arising from the T1 ventral ramus. The other system, which is the distal system of the hand, the motor median innervation of the hand arises from C8 and T1 anterior horns of the spinal cord. Thus having a trajectory similar to Levine's and Shapiro's description of innervation of the lateral aspect of the ring finger with the exception that the fibers from T1 do not contribute to the sensory innervation of the hand, whereas they do to the motor innervation of the hand. One more thing before we leave the subject of innervation of muscles and, and skin by the median nerve is to raise the question does the median nerve have C5 fibers? If we look at the dermatomes I presented to you before, you can see that C5 sensory fibers do not get to the hand. Here they go to the wrist, and here the C5 territory extends to the forearm but it does not reach the hand. Now I have introduced two myotomal charts. The arrow indicates the pronator terrace. This muscle has the distinction of being the most proximal muscle innervated by the median nerve. And as you can see, its fiber arise from C6 and C7. Now, looking at a different chart, you can see that the pronator terrace is innervated again by C6 and C7. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. How many muscles are innervated by the anterior interosseous nerve? A2, B3, C4, D5. This figure shows the muscles of the arm. The white line corresponds to the median nerve and its branches. The new figure I have just introduced is an schematic representation of the median nerve with its motor fibers and branches. The arrow in this frame points to the trunk of the median nerve and now to the anterior interosseous nerve, a motor branch with no cutaneous sensory fibers. Now I have demarcated the elbow segment of the median nerve in the muscle figure and its counterpart in the sketch. Individual branches for four muscles and the anterior interosseous nerve arise from this area. The anterior interosseous nerve itself innervates three muscles. Now I have demarcated a new section in the muscle figure that corresponds to the middle and lower segment of the forearm above the wrist. and the counterpart area in the sketch. No muscles or nerve arise from this 
section. And lastly, I have demarcated the wrist and hand section in the muscle figure and in the sketch. Fibers from these sections innervate five hand muscles. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The cutaneous innervation of the palm thumb region is innervated by a median nerve branch arising before the median nerve goes through the carpal tunnel. A true, B false. The median nerve at the wrist and hand segments give branches to innervate the cutaneous cessation of part of the hand. One of these branches is called the palmaris branch, which leaves the trunk of the median nerve before the nerve arrives to the wrist. Hence, it reaches the hand without going into the carpal tunnel, as you can see in this picture. Much the same as the palmar cutaneous sensory branch of the ulnar nerve leaves the main trunk of the ulnar nerve prior to entering the Gujun's canal. After the palmar cutaneous sensory branch leaves the median nerve trunk, the median nerve trunk goes through the carpal tunnel and gives off the digital branches. These branches innervate the rest of the median nerve skin in the hand as shown in this figure. The digital branches are terminal cutaneous branches of the median nerve. You can see here the distribution of the cutaneous innervation. Notice that innervation of the palmar area of the thumb which arises from the palmaris branch prior to the median nerve entering or going through the carpal tunnel. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The first muscle innervated by the median nerve is a. The flexor carpi radialis, B. The palmaris longus, C. Pronator teres, D. Flexor carpi ulnaris. Now I like to introduce all the structures innervated by the median nerve. The median nerve in the arm does not innervate any structure. In the forearm, it only innervates muscles. From the main trunk, it innervates the pronator teres, which is the first muscle, as we have previously said, that is innervated by the median nerve. The flexor carpi radialis, which is the second muscle innervated by the median nerve. The palmaris longus, which is the third muscle innervated by the median nerve trunk. The flexum digitorum superficialis, also called the flexum digitarum sublimis, is the fourth muscle that arises from the trunk of the median nerve. The anterior interosseous branch arises from the main trunk shortly after the branch of the pronator teres is given as I have presented here. But other times it leaves the trunk after the branch for the flexor digitorum superficialis. So for the flow of our 
explanation, I will keep it exiting the main trunk of the median nerve after the branch for the pronator teres. Be it as it may, the branch for the flexor digitorum profundus is the first branch of the anterior interosseus. Then comes the branch for the flexor pollicis longus, which is the second muscle arising from the anterior interosseous nerve. Next come the pronator quadratus, the last branch arising from the anterior interosseous nerve. In the hand, innervation for cutaneous sensation and muscles are provided by the medial nerve. The muscles innervated are the abductor pollicis brevis, which often is the terminal motor branch of the median nerve, the opponent pollicis, to which I am indicated in the sketch with the arrow, the superficial head of the flexor pollicis brevis, indicated here, the first lumbrical, now indicated, and the second lumbrical, now being indicated. Regarding sensory innervation, the palmaris branch, as we previously mentioned, arises before the median nerve reaches the wrist, and the last branch are the digital branches, here represented as a single branch, as you can see. So, the pronator teres is the first muscle innervated by the median nerve, and the pronator quadratus is the last muscle innervated in the forearm by the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The median nerve innervates the pronator teres after going through it. A true, B false. The pronator teres has a superficial head that arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus and a deep portion that, as you can see in this figure, arises from the ulnar bone. Notice that the median nerve branch for the pronator teres arises proximal to the pronator teres. This new figure shows the three features of the pronator teres that I just mentioned, the superficial head, the deep head, and the branch of the median nerve for the pronator teres arising proximal to the muscle. And in addition, it shows the arch of the pronator teres. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The pronator teres extends to the distal third of the forearm. A true, B false. This is a drawing of the pronator teres. The arrow points to the humeral head, now to the ulnar head, and now to the insertion of this muscle in the radius. Here I have represented the arm muscles and the median nerve with the branches indicating the muscles it innervates. 
Now the arrow is pointing to the pronator terrace. A cut at the level indicated will show multiple structures related to the median nerve, like the pronator terrace. The arrow points to the superficial pronator terrace. At this level, the ulnar head of the pronator terrace is not present. Notice the relation of the superficial pronator terrace with the median nerve. Also notice the brachioradialis muscle just below or dorsal to the median nerve. Now I am pointing to the flexor carpi radialis, the brachial vascular package, and the lacertus fibrosus. At the lower cut, we see the same muscles but with different arrangement. We can see the superficial pronator terrace but also the deep portion of the pronator terrace. The median nerve can be seen embraced by the pronator terrace. The flexor carpi radialis keeps the close relation to the pronator terrace it had in the higher cut with the palmaris longus right behind. If we cut at a level of about the middle of the forearm, we find pretty much the same muscles, but at this level, the pronator terrace is a single mass attached to the radius. We see the median nerve here being hugged by the flexor digiterum superficialis and in close contact with the flexor pollicis longus. More to the center, we see the anterior interosseous branch of the medial nerve, which is called the anterior interosseous nerve. Honoring its name, this is nerve is anterior to the interosseous membrane. Now, if we cut a little lower, we will no longer see the pronatal tears. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The pronatal terrace is tested by asking the patient to pronate the arm with the elbow flexed. A true, B false. The pronatal terrace is tested by the examining resisting the effort of the patient to pronate the forearm against resistance while the arm is extended. The pronator also assists elbow flexion, but testing elbow flexion to determine pronator strength does not help much except in rare occasions. The pronator quadratus is tested by forced pronation too, but with the elbow flex to nullify the contribution of the pronator teres to this movement. This muscle can be tested with a simple handshake and attempting to supinate the patient's forearm when we shake the hand. Intuitively, most of the time, the patient will pronate the forearm. So, pronation with the arm extended is done by both pronators. But with the elbow bend, only the pronator quadratus works. So, the answer to this question is false. Next question, which of the following muscles is innervated by the anterior interosseous nerve? A, 
flexor carpi radialis, B, flexor pollicis longus, C, palmaris longus, D, flexor digitorum superficialis. Going back to the general chart of muscles and cutaneous innervation, attached to the sketch, I have bracket and highlighted in green the area and the muscles innervated from the main trunk. These muscles are the pronator terrace, of which we have already spoken, the flexor carpi radialis, which can be seen at this level just dorsal to the superficial head of the pronator terrace, the palmaris longus, which can be seen dorsal to the flexor carpi radialis, and the flexor digitorum superficialis, behind the palmaris longus. So, these are the muscles innervated by the main trunk. I have now highlighted those innervated by the anterior interosseus. There are three. The radial portion of the flexum digitorum profundus that goes to innervate the index and middle fingers, which is usually referred to as the FTP. This muscle is rather small at this level and quite dorsally located. A cut distally, as you can see here, makes this muscle look larger and going even lower, it dominates the forearm as the most massive muscle in it. You can see here indicated by the arrow the size of this muscle at this junction in the forearm. In the lower third of the forearm region, this muscle is again small and lays anterior to the pronator quadratus. Distal to the branch of the flexum digitorum profundus, we find the flexor pollicis longus. This muscle is abbreviated as FPL. At the level of the elbow, this muscle cannot be observed nor it can usually be visible by MRI rather at the lower part of the upper third of the forearm. At the level of the mid forearm, the flexor pollicis longus can be seen one level below, just it can be found just dorsal to the median nerve. Distal to the FPL, we have the pronator quadratus. The pronator quadratus is a relatively big muscle in the lower third of the forearm. As you can see, indicated by the arrow, I have just moved the arrow a little bit dorsally to point out to you the presence of the interosseous ligament and also how close is the dorsal face of the pronator quadratus to the dorsal aspect 
of the forearm? So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Take a look at these maneuvers and try to answer the following question. Which of the following maneuvers test the flexor digiterum superficialis? The flexor carpi radialis is tested by asking the patient to flex and abduct the wrist while looking at the flexor carpi radialis tendon, which is in line with the second metacarpal bone. You will know the flexor carpi radialis is contracting by seeing the tendon tighten. The palmaris longus is tested by asking the patient to flex the wrist in the same fashion, but this time while looking at the palmaris longus tendon. The tendon for this muscle is the one to the ulnar side of the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon. The flexor pollicis longus is tested by asking the patient to bend the distal phalange while keeping the proximal phalange fixed as indicated in this figure. The flexor digitarum profundus is tested by having the patient flex the distal interphalangeal joint while holding the proximal and middle phalange, as you can see in this figure. This muscle can also be tested by holding the finger at the edge of a flat surface, allowing a space for the distal phalange to bend and asking the patient to bend it, as you can see in this figure again. The flexor digitarum profundus also assists in flexing the wrist, but this function is not tested while testing this muscle because there are too many muscles that do the same function. The flexor digitarum superficialis is tested by asking the patient to flex the middle phalange of any of the fingers. Also by asking the patient to flex the wrist, but again, since this motion is produced by so many different muscles, it's not a good uh, way to test the flexor digiterum superficialis. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. How many muscles are usually innervated by the median nerve in the hand? A3, B5, C4, D6. Some hand muscles are innervated by the distal branch of the medial nerve. These muscles are the opponent pollicis, the abductor pollicis brevis, the superficial head of the flexor pollicis brevis, the first lumbricle, and the second lumbricle. The median nerve, as we have previously mentioned, also is involved in the sensory cutaneous innervation of the hand through the palmar branch, which enters the hand traveling above the wrist ligaments, and the digital branch, which depart from the median nerve after it has gone under the transverse carpal ligament. So the answer to this question is B. Next question, please take a look at this maneuver and decide which of the following maneuver test the opponent policies. As you can see, you have four choices. The lumbricals are tested by holding the finger as seen in this frame and asking the patient to extend the finger that is being held at the proximal interphalangeal joint. The function of the lumbricals are to extend the interphalangeal joint and flex the MP joint. The flexor 
policy's brevis is tested by asking the patient to bend the thumb at the metacarpophalangeal joint. The abductor policy's brevis is tested by resisting the patient's attempt to abduct the thumb. The opponent's policy is tested by resisting thumb opposition as seen in this frame. Opposition involves the carpal metacarpal joint. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Median nerve entrapment can occur under the ligament of struders. A true, B false. Here I have labeled the median nerve and the anterior interosseous nerve. The humerus, the radius, and the ulnar. I will now bring the muscle figure to correlate it with the figure that we're looking at at the moment. I have done this in this new frame. The level of the arrow corresponds with the level indicated by the arrow in the muscle figure. The level by the arrow in the large figure is correlated to the size of the arrow in the muscle figure. The new arrow position in the large figure corresponds to the position of the arrow in the muscle figure. The level indicated by the arrow in the large figure corresponds to below the branching of the anterior interosseous nerve as you can see in the muscle figure. Now the arrow is pointing to the interosseous nerve in the large figure and now in the muscle figure. I have done this so you can get an idea of the location of the lesions that we will see or the abnormalities that we will see in the near future. Now the arrow is pointing to the supracondylar process and now to the ligament below it. This ligament is called the ligament of struders. Entrapment may occur at this level. Entrapment at that level will affect the trunk of the median nerve and therefore all the muscles and sensory innervation of this nerve. The brachial artery also goes under the supracondylar process and at time is involved in the compression of the median nerve. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which of the following structures is most distal in the arm? A. Ligament of extruders. B. Lacertus fibrosus. C. Arch of the pronator teres. D. Sublimis bridge. The supracondylar process and the ligament of a studer is the most proximal structures of the one we have just mentioned. Next come the Lacertus fibrosus, also called the bicipital fibrosus. This is a ligamentous band extending from the proximal region of the bicep tendon to the side of the forearm. The median nerve travels under it. Then comes the pronator teres and most distantly the fibrous arch of the flexor digitarum superficialis, also called flexor digitarum sublimis. This figure pointed by the magenta arrow, you can see the relation between the sublimis bridge and the pronator teres. This new figure is an enlargement of the muscle figure of the area in question. 
the arrow here indicates the flexor pollicis longus. Now the flexor digitarum profundus. And now the flexor digitarum superficialis. The little indentation corresponds to the sublimis bridge in this cartoon. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Entrapment of the anterior interosseous nerve may be due to the presence of cancer muscle. A true, B false. This picture illustrates the cancer muscle. Cancer muscle refers to the accessory head of the flexor pollicis longus. This muscle can cause entrapment of the anterior interosseous nerve. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The lumbricals attach to the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis. A true, B false. The arrow indicates the carpal tunnel all bony structures having been removed around it. The ligament above it is called the flexor retinaculum or the transverse carpal ligament. This is an artistic representation of the same area. The arrow is indicating the flexor retinaculum or transverse carpal ligament attached to the bones. Were we to cut at the level of A, we would see some of the carpal bones, but in addition we will see the ulnar nerve, the ulnar artery, the palmar carpal ligament, which is the roof of the Guillon's canal, the flexor retinaculum, the median nerve, the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis, the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis, the flexor pollicis longus tendon, and the tendons for the flexor digitorum profundus. The lumbricals as you know, originate from the tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus, to which they are very strongly attached. Now, if instead of cutting at the level of A, we cut at the level of B, which is more distal, we will find more or less the same structures, with the exception that the all the nerve and artery are no longer within the Guillaume's canal. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following findings indicate isolated weakness of the flexor pollicis longus? Please take a few minutes or seconds to look at this figure and then move on to try to answer the question. In the brain, you see the intentions, and below, you see the results. This frame indicates weakness of the flexor pollicis longus. The figure in the brain indicates the desired movement, as we just previously mentioned. This movement is called the O sign in Europe and the OK sign in the United States. In Japan, it has a totally different meaning, as pointed out by Dr. Kimura in one of his lectures. The hand below consists of the achieved movement in this case. Notice that the index finger distal interphalangeal joint is flexed, as it should be, but the thumb interphalangeal joint is not, thus demonstrating weakness of the flexor pollicis longus and a normal flexor 
to get their own profunder strength. This weakness can be confirmed by confrontational testing, as you can see indicated by the arrow. Another way to demonstrate isolated flexor policies longus weaknesses by asking the patient to hold a paper between the thumb and the index finger. Normally, the distal phalange of the thumb will flex and use to hold the paper. But if the flexor pollicis longus is weak, the paper will be held by the ventral side of the thumb and not the tip of the thumb. Notice that the index finger is fully flexed, indicating that the flexor digiterum profundus and, in, and also the flexor digiterum superficialis are intact. The position of the hand in this figure demonstrate at least flexor pollicis longus and flexor digiterum profundus weakness. It also demonstrate weakness of the thumb. In this new figure, the middle finger is spared. This occurs not infrequently in lesions involving the anterior interosseous nerve. The figure I've just has introduced the node's weakness of the flexor pollicis longus and flexor digiterum profundus to the index and likely to the middle finger. This posture is called the pinch sign or the Playboy Bonnie sign because some see a resemblance between the bony and the position of the hand. Notice that I have in that I have superposed the hand in that position to show you why some people believe it is similar. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Carpotonal syndrome is a clinical syndrome. A true, B false. Carpotonal syndrome often presents with night hand pain that is relieved by shaking the hand. Later, hand pain comes while holding the phone or driving. The pain in its purest form is restricted to the digital territory of the median nerve. Sparing the territory innervated by the palmar cutaneous division of the medial nerve, as well as those areas innervated by the ulnar and the radial nerve. Yet at times the pain is poorly localized and even the forearm hurts. Tapping the wrist above the median nerve usually produces tingling sensation in the distribution of the hand innervated by the digital branches of the medial nerve. Findings that go against the possibility of carpotonal syndrome are neck pain, pain involving the whole hand, numbness in the region innervated by the palmaris branch of the medial median nerve, and bicep and tricep reflex asymmetry. Carpotonal is often defined as a clinical syndrome characterized by numbness, tingling, burning, and or pain associated with localized compression of the median nerve at the wrist. So the answer to this question is A. True. Next question. Which of the following is not a sign of carpotonal syndrome? A. Fallen sign. B. Flick sign. C. Tinel sign. D. Mumenthaler sign. The Fallen maneuver is illustrated in this frame. 
both hands are flexed against each other. This is usually held for 30 to 60 seconds and if no pain or any tingling sensation in the appropriate region of the hand appears, it's called neg negative. But some people keep the flexion up to about 2 minutes instead of 30 to 60 seconds as most other people do. If no tingling sensation occurs in the appropriate area, then the test is called negative and there is no fallen sign. The cause of the tingling during this maneuver is increased pressure in the carpal tunnel and pinching of the median nerve between the proximal edge of the transverse carpal ligament, another name for the flexor retinaculum, and the anterior border of the distal end of the radius. The increase in pressure results from the dragging of the lumbricals into the carpal canal by the proximal shortening of the flexor digitorum profundus tendon during forced wrist flexion. The term reverse phalen consists of similar findings as in phalen sign but this time with the wrist extended. This is much less reliable than the usual Fallon sign. Some patients use the term praying pain for what happens to them when they, uh, the, when they take this posture. The flick sign, which consists of relieving the hand pain by shaking the hand, is especially true at night when the patient wakens up in the middle of the night. This shaking seems to relieve their pain significantly. Tinel sign, tingling and at times pain in the territory of the nerve being tapped, in this case the territory innervated by the digital branches of the median nerve following tapping above the median nerve at the wrist, is also a sign of carpal tunnel syndrome. The OK sign, implying the failure to make the OK sign in Europe this maneuver is called making the letter O maneuver and failure of doing so is called the pinch sign. The pinch sign consists of inability to, rest to restrict contact to the tip of the finger and the thumb when attempting to make an OK sign. This sign usually implies lesion in the anterior interosseous nerve or above. It is due to failure of the flexor pollicis longus and flexor digiterum profundus to contract. In this figure you can see a normal OK maneuver and now an abnormal OK maneuver which produces the pinch sign. So the answer to this question is T. Next question. Most median nerve pathology at the elbow is axonal loss. A true, B false. The most common cause of median nerve injury at the elbow is needle or cannulas. The most common type of pathology is axonal. This pathology has three periods. Within three days of the injury, we may find conduction block involving the sensory and motor fibers. Between four and eight days, we may find, and we usually find, conduction block in the sensory fibers but the motor fibers present axonal failure. The earlier failure of the motor axon is the consequence of early failure of the presynaptic region at the level of the neuromuscular junction. After nine days, we will find conduction failure in both fibers. So the answer to this question is 
true. Next question. Resisted flexion of the PIP joint of the middle finger producing paresthesia in the median nerve digital territories suggests median nerve entrapment at A. Head of the pronators B. Sublimis bridge C. Ligament of extruder D. Lacertus fibrosus Pain triggered by the patient's pronating the arm against resistance while attempting to extend the elbow, especially if associated with tingling sensation in the median nerve digital distribution, is suggestive but certainly not indicative of an entrapment of the median nerve at the pronator teres arch. Pain on attempt to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint of the middle finger against resistance if associated with tingling sensation of the median nerve theta distribution suggests median nerve entrapment at the sublimis bridge. Pain on attempt by the patient to flex the elbow with the forearm supinated against resistance if associated with tingling sensation of the median nerve theta distribution suggest median nerve entrapment by the Lacertus fibros fibrosus. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The characteristic findings of anterior interosseous syndrome, also called Kilo Nevin syndrome, locates the lesion to the anterior interosseous nerve proximal trunk. A true, B false. The arrow in this frame points to the interosseous membrane and the anterior interosseous nerve right in front of it. A lesion in this nerve produces typical manifestations. An anterior interosseous nerve injury produces weakness of, the, of pronation, especially when the elbow is flexed weakness of flexor pollicis longus producing inability to flex the tip of the thumb and weakness of the flexor digitorum profundus producing inability to bend the tip of the middle and the index finger. These symptoms are at times referred to as spinner syndrome. In patients with weakness in these muscles, the index finger is often more affected than the middle finger as it is in the case indicated by the arrow. Regarding the location of these findings, because of the fascicular nature of the distribution of the anterior interosseous fibers within the median nerve, as indicated in this frame, and pointed by the green arrow, a lesion at this level in the median nerve can produce findings similar to those that occurred with a lesion proximal in the anterior interosseous nerve. This study was done showing such encounter. That is, lesions in the median nerve at the level of the arm producing deficits suggestive of an anterior interosseous nerve. Lesion. This can occur with monofocal or with multifocal lesions. In addition, involvement of the muscles innervated by the anterior interosseous nerve can occur with brachial plexus neuritis. So, the presence of findings suggested of an anterior interosseous syndrome does not for certain localize the lesion to the anterior interosseous nerve. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which muscle is weak? Please notice in the brain the desire movement 
and below the movement achieved. And the muscles are, which are your choices, A. Flexor pollicis longus, B. Flexor digitorum sublimis, C. Flexor digitorum profundus, D, A, and C. With flexion digitorum profundus weakness, the distal phalanx becomes extended on attempting to make the OK sign. But the thumb distal phalanx flexes well. With weakness of the flexor pollicis longus, the distal thumb phalanx does not flex well, but the index and middle fingers do. With proximal anterior interosseous nerve lesion, thumb, index, and ring fingers are involved, although sometimes the ring finger is spared. As we previously mentioned, this syndrome is called the Kilo Nevin syndrome, and the hand posture is also at times called the spinner's sign. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The most common electrodiagnostic finding in carpal tunnel syndrome is A. Axonal failure B. Conduction block C. Conduction slowing D. Axonal block the pathology of the carpal tunnel syndrome varies in relation to time. Initially, we find inflammation of the flexor tendons, followed by expansion of the tensosynovium. Then, pressure goes up inside the tunnel. Then, the pressure within the median nerve goes up as a consequence of decreased pressure in the tunnel. This is followed by median nerve demyelination and ultimately, but very, very late, median nerve axonal loss appears. By far, median nerve demyelination is the most common finding we encounter in patients with carpal tunnel syndrome. And the most frequent pathology is demyelination, which leads to conduction slowing more frequently than to any other electrodiagnostic abnormality. Conduction slowing can be synchronized or desynchronized. Synchronized conduction slowing occurs because there is a short span of demyelination affecting all fibers at the same segment of the nerve equally. The synchronized conduction slowing occurs when short span of demyelinating is scattered affecting fibers at different segments of the nerve. So the answer to this question is C. Thank you very much for your attention.